Good evening, everybody. It's Rich and Bearcat. It's about 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. I'm in my office in Las Vegas, Nevada. So I put out a, a quick end of day video for you. And this one is going to be covering humility and having tunnel vision. When, I wouldn't say when, I'm going to say if you want to get anything done in Nigeria. I suppose it applies to anything that you do in life. But this one is going to be specific to whatever projects that you are working on in Nigeria. I would probably say I stopped really caring what people thought about me the moment I had my daughter. Our first daughter, Jeanette, six years ago. She just turned six on this month. Well, actually, no. <laughs> We're in November. This is November 2nd. She turned six on October 19th of this year. Uh, obviously, yes, I care what people think. But... What I thought was important when she was the moment she was born, everything that I had prioritized up until that point, you could, let me just give you a visual. I kind of liken it to driving down the freeway, rolling down your window and just throwing things out of the window. What I thought was important to me became unimportant very, very fast after my daughter was born. And then fast forward two and a half years later, our second daughter was born. So we have a six-year-old and we have a two-year-old going on three in in December of this year. So she's going to be three. So by 2025, by January 1st, 2025, I'm going to have a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old daughter in the house because Nelly turns three December 30th. Now, when it comes to everything that we're doing now in Nigeria as far as our business and the diversification of our portfolio as far as our investment goes everything that I do is approached with both humility and tunnel vision and by humility I mean stripping down layers of what you think it's important to then get to the core of what is really, really, really important. And as you continue, and again, I'm talking to Nigerians abroad who 
have immigrated to the to the, either the United States or anywhere outside of the borders of Nigeria as a result of opportunities, whether it's education or being a spouse whose spouse filed the paperwork for you to come over. What's going to happen is the people that you've left behind back home will start looking at you a little bit differently if you allow it you will be looked upon as a provider you will be looked upon as an ATM an automated teller machine aka a bank and they'll also be looking at you as a savior or a safety net don't fall for that because it is super artificial some of you at some point are going to be for me I didn't I didn't realize how much time I had wasted taking care of family and friends and I did this from 19 till 30 and I've told this story before. If you're listening for the first time, it wasn't when I was when I am 46 years old today. But it wasn't until I was 30 years old and I had been saving the world, meaning providing for people in Nigeria. I had certain people on allowances. I was displeasing myself financially to please others back home. And I did it from 19 to 30. And in that 11 year span, where I had enlisted in the United States Army from 19 to 22, so three years, upon completing my enlistment, I I utilized $20,000 of my Montgomery GI Bill to go to college. Educated myself, got my bachelor's degree in film production from Cal State University in Northridge. Worked some odd jobs here and there to make ends meet. And for the 11 years that I was trying to figure out who I was as a human being, and trying to develop myself as a man, as a person. I mean, yes, in that time frame from 19 to 20 to 30, obviously I was young. I didn't have a lot of counsel. I didn't have a lot of guidance. And I didn't know that I can say no to people in Nigeria. So for, the, for that 11 years that I broke my back, did all sorts of odd jobs, even with a college degree, I still had to grind, sending money home for funerals, sending money back to Nigeria for, for holidays, Christmases, birthdays, Someone is going, you know, I want to travel. I need money. You help them fund their trip. Oh, my children are hungry and starving. If you don't help us out, they're going to starve to death. You dip into the last money you have in your savings to take care of that problem with us. Growing, growing up, it was what they had brainwashed you to believe that you are supposed to because you are in America. You are supposed to give back. But when I look back now at 46 years old, for the 11 years that I supported these people financially, none of them ever asked me 
where I was getting the money. Just let that sink in for a second. None of them ever asked me where I was getting the money. None of these people ever asked me if I had eaten that day. None even bothered to, hey, I want to send you Gary. Or I want to send you some food from Nigeria. I want none of that happened for the eleven. And while I was doing this, I didn't really think about it until that light bulb moment when I was thirty years old. I had. I was in a relationship at that time. A relationship that ended up that ended, a relationship that I did not want to end but ended. So you could. Essentially say she I was broken up with she, my girlfriend at the time broke up with me and I was just in a very very compromised state of mind and as a result of that breakup at 30 that breakup ended up affecting my productivity at work. The job that I had at the time, I mean, Matt was managing some, I wouldn't say the, the industry, the I was a manager, I managed a team, but um, because my mind was not right as a result of that breakup, my productivity was compromised at work. And as a result, the company ended up letting me go so I had two issues that I was dealing with at the time. I was just lost my relationship and lost my job. And I remember sitting in the bedroom of this one bedroom apartment that I shared with my girlfriend at the time. She, after the relationship, she ended up moving out. So I was in this cold, you don't realize how cold an apartment can be until your girlfriend or your boyfriend leaves and creates a void. And I'm like, man, this apartment is, <laughs> this apartment is kind of cold. <laughs> but when they were there, it was warm and cozy and comfortable. And when they moved out, I was left with, you know, they move out, they pack their things. And I was left with just my stuff. Spaces that used to be filled with this person's belongings was now empty. Shoes were gone. The closet was, I only had my clothes in the closet now. The furniture or whatever it is that the, country, the person contributed to the household. They basically took everything. And left. So I was sitting there in this cold, cold. You're talking about fall in Los Angeles. Cold fall night. Staring at the ceiling in bed, unable to move. And at that point, when I was at my worst, and the most one of the most vulnerable moments of my life. I looked around and there was nobody for me to call. Nobody was saving the savior. Nobody was around to provide for the provider. Nobody was around to even listen to my heartbreak. Stemming from both losing the relationship and losing my job at the time. I looked up, looked down, looked to the left, looked to the right, looked in front of me, looked behind me. There wasn't a single person who I had helped for 11 years that was in any position to even offer time for me to vent and be consoled. 
that was the beginning of the end of my relationship with Nigerian generosity. As things may be, I started slowly picking up the pieces, started picking up myself from the floor one day at a time, one minute at a time, slowly, but slowly, slowly, but surely, I started getting myself together. First, emotionally, even in some cases, physically, I was always very fit, worked out. Um, and in order for me to I, then I enrolled at the time in grad school that I ended up dropping out of because I just wasn't ready. But I enrolled, just things like that, just making, just taking those little actionable steps. Slowly, I recovered. Took a little bit of time. But I recovered from that episode or that chapter of my life. And where am I getting at with this story? Where I'm getting at with this story is majority of you, and I have seen cases after cases of Nigerians in the diaspora trying to play God, trying to save the world, trying to help out their siblings at their own personal and financial detriment. There's even a case of someone that I know who, who would send money to Nigeria but cannot afford to pay his rent here in the United States. He has to put his rent on a credit card and then pay off that credit card when he got paid from his job. So there are cases like that. A lot of it hits home because my father was is also part of that case study. 42 years in the United States. 42 years my dad spent in the United States taking care of people back home, saving the world, paying school fees, paying medical bills, taking care of everybody but himself. And when he died in 2020, he died with absolutely nothing to show for it. So much so that the people that he was helping didn't even bother to show up at his funeral because the money, what use is the dead person to them? It happens. So you have got to really, you don't have to wait for things to happen to you for you to learn. You have to take other people's experiences and ensure that you don't repeat those mistakes. As you are building for the current projects that I'm working on right now in Oyewa Kwebom State, only one family member knows what I'm doing. Only one. And some of you will feel the need to share your projects publicly on platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, these little social media channels. 
And I, and I know why you're doing that. You've worked so hard to buy that plot of land. You've worked so hard to finally break ground on that development that you've been doing, that you have been cultivating in your mind. You've worked so hard abroad to finally be able to launch some sort of business. And what you're doing is by posting it, you are sharing your personal sacrifices and personal accomplishment. But to some people, especially your siblings and your friends in Nigeria, they are going to look at that as you've landed. The eagle has landed. The eagle has arrived. And they will try to manipulate and leverage that to start begging you for money, giving you the sob stories, trying to take that little money that you've set aside to build your future. They are going to try to separate that from you to take care of their, to take care of themselves. That is just what's going to happen. And it's happened to me. So if you notice over the, for people who have been following me over the past, and before I go into what I'm going to say now, and that is the, actually the reason why I created the Embarricade Network private WhatsApp group. This is for people to, to be free to share their accomplishments with others who are doing, not with family members, not with friends, with other developers, with other business people. That is why I created that private WhatsApp group so you can put out what you've done, share your projects. No one is gonna ask you for money on the American Network WhatsApp group. No one is gonna give you any sob stories. What you're doing is, Iron sharpens iron. You are sharing this with a community of like minds to be able to gain some tips and insights, to be able to gain some advice, to, to, to be able to gain some sort of like mentorship. And hey, if I'm doing something wrong, how can I improve? How can I be better? That is the reason why I created that platform where I can actually, because I don't want to harbor what I'm doing just at home with my family, with my wife and my kids. I wanted to be able to share that with others that's not necessarily family members or friends because I know that they are in the same boat as me. We are all trying to build a life for ourselves beyond the United States. We want to be able to build an income stream beyond the United States dollar. We wanna be able to build an income stream back home so we can have the flexibility to be able to earn an income in Nigeria and also earn an income in the United States or abroad. That is the reason why I built that platform, the Embarcat Network WhatsApp group, and we are almost at 60 members right now, majority of whom are based abroad, connecting with each other and also connecting with resources back in Nigeria. So, that and this is the tunnel vision aspect that I'm talking about being focused, re removing anything that's going to distract you or impede you from accomplishing your goals because that's what's going to happen when you're sharing your builds, you're sharing your projects on public platforms like Facebook, public where for the world to see. You start, that was what happened to me. I started attracting the people that I wasn't even trying to attract. I started attracting people who were looking at me as if I just had this boatload of money sitting somewhere with nothing to do for it, nothing to do with it. And here I am building. So they're going to try to see how they can get a piece of that. So as a result of that, a lot of these so-called cousins were coming out of the woodwork, coming from any, from WhatsApp, hitting me up on WhatsApp. 
Hey, uh, uh, uncle. Now I'm the uncle. Hey, big bros. Now I'm the big bros. Hey, this. Hey, that. No, hey, how are you? How's the family? And in some of them, they'll start with that. But eventually, it always ends with what you can do for them. I started blocking everybody. I started blocking. If I'm saying hi to you and that conversation in a split second turns to anything that involves you asking me for money, immediately, I don't care who you are, you're blocked. As a result, I'm able to stay focused on what I'm doing. I'm able to stay focused on my projects. That is how I'm able to accomplish the things that I'm accomplishing today by just having that zero tolerance, tunnel vision. Now, when it comes to humility, especially if you're operating in Nigeria, you've got to park that American flexing at the door, especially if you want to be physically active back home like I am. You've got to park that flexing at home and pick it up when you get back. No one is saying you can't flex and you, you know you can't flex flex and show your designer clothes and your designer bag and your designer shoes and your logoed t-shirt. But when you are doing things in Nigeria, you have got to come down and operate low under the radar. When you operate low under the radar, I don't wear name brand clothes in Nigeria. I wear my Barricade branded t-shirts and Barricade branded hats. And I maybe take maybe five t-shirts with me, all in Barricade branded. Take my hats, take one or two pants with me for the two weeks that I'm there in Nigeria. That is what I wear. Because I don't want to draw unnecessary attention to myself. Anything that is going to draw attention to me that's going to prevent me from accomplishing my goals, I set aside. So I can blend in Nigeria today. You would think I'm just another guy. Living around the corner. I speak the language, I eat the food, I communicate locally with them, I behave like I'm one of them. You're not going to be able to tell that I'm based in the US unless I tell you that I'm based in the United States. That is how low profile and how low key I am when I'm in Nigeria. Working. Because you're there to work. You're there to make, again, this is if you're there for that. If you're there to work and you're there to make money and you're there to build a business or build or build projects. And these are the people that I'm talking to. I'm not talking to the people who are going for holidays and who are going to have fun. Those kinds can, you can wear your Salvatore Ferragamo t-shirts and advertise yourself as somebody who's based abroad. You can wear your fancy earrings. And just stick out like a sore thumb. And draw that attention to yourself. You can do that if you are going for pleasure. But if you are going for business. Who, these are the people, this is my audience. Nigerians who are ready to kill it over there. You got to get that on blank t-shirt. No logo. Plain jeans. The shoes that I wear in Nigeria are regular beat up shoes that I wear here in the United States when I'm moving about my business. I am trying to, to, to be as invisible as possible. Now, after my project is done and I am away from the scene and I'm away from the energy and I'm in Lagos, in my hotel room trying to get back to the United States, then I can relax. Yes, throw on that polo shirt if I want to, throw on that fancy pair of shoes if I want to, 
But I, when you are in the trenches for, the, for that two weeks that you are getting off of work, three weeks at the most that you're getting off of work to go and do something back home, every moment has to count. And anything that draws attention to you that is not in furtherance of what you're trying to do, you got to figure out what is the root cause, what is all this, and eliminate that. Minimizing your accessibility to friends and family. Minimizing your exposure to people who, have, who can't help you. Minimizing yourself to these things allows you to open yourself up to resources that can help you take your projects from point A to point B. So humility goes a long way. This isn't saying that you can't come back to the United States or abroad or Germany, wherever you are, and go live that kind of lifestyle. But I'm saying when you are in the trenches in Nigeria, you have got to blend in as much as you can. I mean, I, I would wear shorts and my Tom's slides. That is how I roll. And as a result, I'm able to get more accomplished compared to somebody who's trying to be spick and span, clean cut, wearing their designer clothes. You can't even move around with, without you worrying about if someone is going to stain your shirt. I don't care about stuff like that because I'm wearing, I'm plain t-shirts anyway. You can stain my plain t-shirt. You can step on my Tom slides. You could rip my jeans. Because I know what I'm in Nigeria for. And the majority of these people anyway who are doing all this flexing, they don't have it like that. You can flex, flex with other rich Nigerians that are doing it in the shadows. As you continue to get older and mature in this business, in this game of life, you will realize that flexing is not, the real flexing is unpublicized. It's done in private. When you're sitting there in that room with a cigar and a bourbon talking business with somebody that's doing business in Kenya that you're trying to get in, that's doing business in other regions that you're trying to get in, that is flexing. It's not walking around with your Versace shirts and your, your Ferragamo shoes in Nigeria. Who is it that you're flexing? These people don't really care. If anything, they're going to look at you as somebody they can get something from. Watch your presentation. When you are moving around in Nigeria, what are you communicating? Are you waving a red flag saying, hey, see me, see me, this is who I am, I'm from abroad? Or are you not waving a red flag and just blending into where they don't even know if you're from abroad or not? If you are trying to accomplish anything in Nigeria, you want to be the latter. The latter, L-A-T-T-E-R. Fly low under the radar. Get your business going first. Get your projects in order. Have that straight, strict tunnel vision. And then join that Mbarikat network on WhatsApp. It's a private group. It's free. Where you are free to share your projects. And you're free to communicate your challenges and your successes with others who are doing the exact same thing that you're doing. And follow the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that notification bell 
so you get videos like this when they are posted, delivered to your inbox. We are in the business of empowering other Nigerians abroad to become successful abroad and back home. You don't have to limit yourself to beyond the shores of Nigeria. You can be successful abroad and also take that experience and go apply it to Nigeria and be successful there. There are more time. Nigeria is ready for business. There's so many opportunities out there that you can tap into. Some of whom that I've mentioned in some previous videos that I've done that you should go look at. We have over 250 videos on our YouTube channel covering all sorts of topics from business to investments to e-commerce to branding to Amazon to, to running your own you know, import and export, having your own website, agriculture, real estate, farming, land procurement, property development. These resources are available to you so you don't end up making the same mistakes that our parents made. Because today's Nigeria is not the Nigeria of your fathers. Today's America is not the America that your parents, the, the America of your parents. It's a different time. And you got to have that you got to be able to leverage your experience, your resources abroad to be able to capitalize back home in Nigeria. But you have got to be humble and you have got to stop sharing things with people that can't contribute to your success and become a part of this community that we've built. Where no one is going to judge you. No one is going to ask for money. Everyone is just there to support and help each other. When you're posting your projects, we have, I share content like that on these platforms. You get to know the price of cement in real time. You get to know the price of granite chippings, the price of building materials, so you don't get ripped off. Many, many years ago, when I first started my, my path, to investing. I didn't start today. I've always wanted to invest in Nigeria, but I just never had that help. I never had family members who were trying to rip me off. Back then, a bag of cement was, I'm talking about early 2000s, where they were selling a bag of cement for a thousand naira. You send your family member to go, and this has happened to me where I, I sent a family member to go to go inquire about the price. They came back and told me that it was 5,000 Naira a bag when it was 1,000 Naira a bag. When I sent somebody else to go inquire, they told me, oh, why did cement right now, a 50 kg bag is going for 1,000. I'm talking about back then in early 2000. Then why is my family member telling me that it's 5,000? Love your parents, love your mom, love your siblings, love your, love your family member. No one is saying don't love them. But just know that they may not have your best interest at heart. And that is the beauty of social media. Um, the beauty of this YouTube channel is I am able to share my experiences with you. So you don't have to make the same mistakes that I did. Had I had, this, had, I had the support back in early 2000, I would have had multiple properties right now in Nigeria. I'm hoping this helps. Any questions, comments, post them in the comment section. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Where we're there to help you, where we're there to help each other and empower one another. And please be sure to share this content. Okay, I gotta run. It's late. I'm getting ready to go to bed. 
and I will catch you guys another time. Check out the other videos that we have on the on the YouTube channel. Like them, like them, share them, comment. Because that is how we're able to reach more Nigerians who just want to be successful. And want to help develop the economy of Nigeria and create jobs for locals. Okay? My name is Richard Barker, guys. Let's call it a night. Talk to you guys later.